God, we're thankful for how good you are and how you revealed yourself to us um, through the work of the Holy Spirit who has opened up our hearts and our eyes to to know and to see uh, the truth that is um, your worth and value and the greatness of your glory and your majesty and your mercy and God uh, we just confess that we we need mercy Uh, we fall short every day Uh, we desperately need forgiveness and you've brought that to us you brought us the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ Um, and so we are thankful for his work God we pray that you would Help us see our sins, see where we need to confess and repent, see where we need to grow. Um, be with us now as we study your word and as we continue thinking about um, just correct theology and trying to be truthful and trying to understand uh, what your word says. God, let our time be beneficial and edifying to us all uh, that we would be more conformed into Christ's image. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. All right, so welcome back. Um, it's, it's good to be with you again. It's good to continue our study uh, in biblical theology. Uh, this is Lesson 24 uh, this evening. We're con- continuing our study on God the Holy Spirit. And tonight, we're not going to be uh, thinking of anything new. Uh, we're going to be reminded of what the Scriptures tell us about how the Spirit works in our lives and how He's worked in the world, and how He continues to work. And, you know, I mentioned last week when we started uh, this section, thinking about the Holy Spirit, is that of the three divine persons, I think the Holy Spirit, at least in the camps that we're in, and the churches that we're used to, is probably the most neglected in attention of the three persons. And, And I think there are logical reasons for that. Uh, we recognize in the culture and in the world that we live in that there are some people who only believe in the Holy Spirit, right? And, and everything is about um, certain charismatic behaviors and things like that. Um, but, as we kind of mentioned uh, Sunday night, I mentioned briefly when we were preparing for the Lord's Supper, um, a theological overcorrection is not right. You know, just because a lot of people might get something wrong doesn't give us the right to go the other way and miss what God's Word tells us, right? And so uh, we don't want to neglect the overwhelming scriptural witness uh, for the works of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And um, we, I think we neglect that. And we may not recognize that uh, to the extent that hopefully we will. So tonight the goal is not really to see anything new, but be reminded uh, of how the Scripture teaches us about the Holy Spirit and what He does. We've we've considered His person uh, last week. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. So that might get interesting as we consider some various perspectives on what that looks like. Uh, But tonight, we're going to be thinking about the Holy Spirit work and hopefully be refreshed um, to have a greater appreciation uh, for Him and and how much we need Him in our lives. So our lesson summary, and this will cover the general things we're going to consider in the next 45 minutes. But while the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work together inseparably, um, their roles in creation, redemption, and consummation are distinct. The Spirit's work is particularly associated with speaking, with the application of salvation, and indwelling God's people. And so that, that's our general outline we're going to consider. And we'll break that down more and see what needs to be said about that summary. So let's begin uh, with the table talk. And so at your table, if, if you're not at a table, you need to join one um, for the next few minutes. But, or if you're at a small table, talk to the table next to you. But in what ways have you recognized the Holy Spirit at work in your own life. So, so think to your own, uh, your own experience and 
consider, share, encourage one another, maybe, um, how you've seen the Holy Spirit at work in your own journey to this point. So let's take just a couple minutes uh, to consider this, and then we'll share a little bit, and then we'll dive in. It's been about uh, three minutes-ish. Um, in what ways have you recognized the Holy Spirit at work in your own life? So let's hear. Um, let's hear some thoughts. What what say? Uh, what say some of you? What kinds of things have you recognized? Who can identify with that in the room? Right. We all can, right? The, the Holy Spirit definitely does that. Um, we, we recognize our sin, right? Hey, that's another work of the Spirit, right? To, to bring our sin to our minds. But we, we all can affirm, uh, and in our minds we recognize that we're the worst sinner that we know, but we could be way worse, right? <laughs> if not for the restraint of the Spirit. What else? Something else. Let's get one more, one more shared response. In relation to that, I was just thinking of First Corinthians ten thirteen. You know, the temptations to come to man. Yeah. I'll just give you a paraphrase, but but you're not allowed to be tempted no more than label, but it's about a way. Escape so we can stand up. Yeah. And I was just sharing that, you know, that you know, when you're tempted, and we are, um, we have the red flags go up. And it's the Holy Spirit that, that gives us that warning sound, like what he's saying. And, uh, uh, but he provides that way out. So the right. Holy Spirit, you know, we may not be obedient to it or to him. 
there to, like what he said, you know, to guide. Yeah. Uh, you know, be our counselor. No doubt. No doubt. And, uh, you know, we, we could, I could call on all of us and we would all have, I think, tons of things to share because we, we understand that if you are a Christian, then the Holy Spirit has been incredibly active in your life, right? Uh, from beginning to end. And the Holy Spirit has always been working, and He is working now. And so we'll, we'll look at some of the big picture areas of the way that He works in a general way, as seen in God's Word. But I want to start... Um, with one quick theological term. And this, if you see there, is the inseparable operation of the Trinity. And some would call this the doctrine of inseparable operations. And although that's a lot of jargon, it seems it's pretty obvious, I think, what, what this is trying to communicate. And the reason we would start with this is we're going to be emphasizing um, for this whole lesson the specific works of one person in the Trinity. But we bring this up to explain that none of the persons within the Trinity work independent of the other two. All right? And this is a critical part of the doctrine of the Trinity is that they are united. And just three quick thoughts here. Three basic points of this and, and a couple of references in a minute. But there is perfect unity among the three persons in the one divine nature. And so we, we talked about the Trinity a, a whole lesson. And we've addressed topics related to the Trinity all throughout because it's critically important uh, to Christianity. And so... When we talk about the works of the persons of the Godhead, uh, we must recognize that there is perfect unity among the three persons in everything that they do. And so the persons within the Trinity are not at odds with one another. Um, second, uh, there is a mutual indwelling of the persons. And this is complicated, uh, but um, the word... Um, in Latin that we use to describe this is circumincession. Not to be confused with something that sounds much like. And if you're very immature, like me and my wife, we giggled when I told her the term. But it's different because what is being described is the indescribable, basically. But the three distinct persons in the Trinity are in one another, and they're all around one another. That's, that's the term. They're, they indwell one another in every way. And they're united yet distinct. That's where that term comes from. And third, um, they are undivided in purpose and will. And so they don't have distinct wills apart from one another. They're accomplishing uh, the same thing. Now, there's... There's perfect unity. So the one God, the, the one divine nature, creates, saves, and sanctifies. And, and there's nothing that the Father does, the Son does, or the Spirit does that's independent from the other persons. Um, and they're so mutually indwelled that as the Father works, the Son and Spirit are working um, in a united way. And because they all share in the one undivided purpose and will, they are consistent in their actions. And so we share that just to say, um, you can get into trouble when you start dividing uh, the purposes of the persons. And you start to create distinct wills among the persons of the Trinity. We run into some problems that we'll consider a little while later. Um, Augustine, uh, early church father said it this way, The Father and Son and Holy Spirit, as they are indivisible, so they work indivisibly. Because they're undivided, all their works are united. And just a couple of uh, general passages here uh, to see this described. I'll give us two. Uh, Galatians 4, 
um, 4 through 6, we see the, the divine mission of God represented in a particular way. And so Paul writes here, he says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So in this divine mission of God to save His people, we have all three persons working, united, accomplishing this purpose. I mean, these are things we've covered, uh, but I just want to remind us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 4-6, through 6, and we'll talk about this verse later in our application, but it says, There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and in everyone. So, here we see even the persons of the Trinity, all three, united in their work in the local church, because that's the context here in 1 Corinthians 12, the, the gifts and service of individual local churches and their members. And we have this united work. So we, we could look at a ton of other texts, but I wanted to mention that lest we, while looking at the particular works of one of the persons, we don't divide them, so to speak. So we're going to look at um, three primary ways, some general ways that we see the Holy Spirit's works uh, in Scripture and in our lives. And this first specific work is that of speaking. Um, And so what does that mean? What does it mean that speaking is a work of the Holy Spirit? And so we'll look at that in a few ways. Um, And there, there are a few ways to consider this particular work. And so when we look in the Scriptures, if we were to go to the beginning and work through the Old Testament and work forward, uh, we would see language pretty common uh, where the Holy Spirit would come upon a person and then they would speak. All right, God, would, God would speak through this person. Um, and, that, and that's one way we see the Spirit working. We think of prophecy. Um, this first passage in Numbers chapter 11, and it says, The Lord... Uh, came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and him is Moses, and took, so this is interesting, took some of the Spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. In this account, we have God working uh, to give Moses wisdom to help him appoint uh, elders among the people so that they can administrate what's going on, so that they can help one another, and they can lead. And here, as soon as God put the Holy Spirit on these elders, they begin to speak. They begin to prophesy um, the words of God. Um, Another example, if we were to jump to the New Testament, which we'll still see other examples of prophecy here, uh, but this one, um, actually I was going to share one more, but I didn't put it in my PowerPoint, I think. But another text in Numbers, um, we see the Holy Spirit even causing people that weren't a part of God's people to prophesy. If you remember uh, the account of Balaam and how God speaks through a donkey to Balaam. But in that interaction over those three chapters, we have Balaam, uh, this prophet of a different people, cursing God's people. And then uh, in chapter 24, we have the Holy Spirit comes upon Balaam and then he begins to prophesy blessings to God's people. The, The Holy Spirit work that in him. In this text, um, when Elizabeth meets Mary there, and it says, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Baby John the Baptist, right? And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And so we have the Holy Spirit causing Elizabeth to speak, in this account, and she speaks blessing over the Christ, right? The Christ child in Mary's womb and and over to God and to God's Son. Uh, But this is worked in her by the Spirit. Again, um, this would be 
a different situation. Soon later, there was a man. This was a man who came in the temple full of the Spirit, Simeon, who uh, long God told him that he would see the Christ. And you remember, they bring baby Jesus there in the temple. Simeon sees him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he blesses God. Um, the Spirit came into the temple, and it came upon him. I have some of that because it's a long account there, but took the baby in his arms, and he blessed God. So this working of the Spirit to speak um, is something we see in God's people. Um, and, and not to rank this kind of speaking, but what's another way? We'll, we'll ask a question. What's another way that we've seen the Spirit um, speak, in a sense, that is likely the most influential in all of our lives, even today? What do you think? Sounds like a trick question, but it's really not. What's a way that the Spirit has spoken in the past that we benefit from, should benefit from, every day? Yes, Gabe? The Bible, right? Who, who was it who inspired the authors of Scripture? The Holy Spirit, right? The, the Holy Spirit was working... Uh, to cause the inspiration of the words. And and we talked about that early on. We consider the doctrine of Scripture and all the details that goes into that and and how that worked. But the Holy Spirit has always done that. We have the example of the prophets. We have the example of Scripture itself. This is 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So no doubt a a unified triune work, but we have the authors of Scripture primarily attributing the work of Scripture to the Holy Spirit. To the Holy Spirit. So you could say, uh, without the work of the Holy Spirit, we don't have Scripture. We don't have the, the bread that we need for all of our life. Um, We're dependent upon the Holy Spirit who's given us His Word and breathed it out, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, that all Scripture is breathed out by God. So in these two passages, we see that from the very beginning, uh, working through the prophets and the patriarchs to the writing of Scripture, uh, to even now as... God works in us through the Spirit to speak His truth and to bless Him. We've seen this is the Holy Spirit's work. Second, and this one's a little longer, we'll consider some general thoughts here too, but we'll say applied salvation. Obviously the work of salvation is a trying work of God, um, but when we look at the Scriptures, we see that the Holy Spirit is particularly described as applying salvation to us. Um, He he does many things, and we'll consider just a few general ideas here. Uh, Here's three points we'll make. Uh, The first is this, is that the Holy Spirit is at work before we believe the Gospel. We understand this, right? Um, The Holy Spirit is at work in us prior to us even believing God's Word. And we could look at a ton of texts to see that, but is that good news? That's good news, right? Because we weren't looking. We weren't looking for God. We were were dead in our sins. And the Holy Spirit brought several things to us if we were to look at one text that covers a lot of it. This is John 16, 8 through 11. And this is Jesus uh, speaking here to His disciples and He's talking about the sending of the Holy Spirit whom He sends um, after His ascension. And it says, And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see Me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. And so we could make some general applications from every verse in this passage 
of really a different way we see the Spirit working in this bringing conviction. So before we even believed the gospel, um, the Holy Spirit is at work in verse 8, and He's convicting us and bringing our minds to understand that we're sinners. Right? No, no one can believe the gospel unless they understand that they're sinners. And that is a work of the Holy Spirit. He's convicted us in that way. And He causes us uh, to recognize our need for righteousness. So He convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness. Um, second, there in verse 9, concerning sin because they do not believe in Me. And so I, I think one way we could apply that is that um, the Spirit... Uh, shows us our moral failure, particularly that we're unbelievers. It's the Spirit that has shown us that, that, that we were living in unbelief. He brings that to our minds, um, at least in the positive sense. In verse 10, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, um, well, He demonstrates for us, and, and is this true or not? Has the Holy Spirit helped you to understand that your self-righteousness is worthless? Right? It's the Spirit that does that. It's the Spirit that shows us that we don't have righteousness. Right? The Holy Spirit does this, that we don't have a, a way to earn favor with God. And then verse 11, uh, the ruler of this world is judged. And the, the Spirit opens up our eyes to see this, that we, we can't just... Um, we can't judge ourselves and compare ourselves to some other sinner, right? Because everybody stands judged. All right? no, no one has righteousness. Um, and the Spirit is who works in us to see this. And second, the Holy Spirit's at work in our believing the Gospel. All right? so, so He's working in us before we even believe the Gospel. And then in the act of believing, it's the Holy Spirit that works that in us and, and we could look at a ton of texts, but here's just a few. Um, the first one, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 3b, the second half of that text is, Paul writes there, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is Lord is the confession of our faith, right? He, he is Lord of lords. He is King of kings. And we cannot confess that in sincerity apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit, I'm Lord, right? I, I'm King. It's, it's the Spirit that reveals that truth to us, that we're wrong. It's Jesus. Um, and Jesus, in His interaction with Nicodemus, I mean, He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so here we're, we're thinking about the doctrine of regeneration, right? The, the new birth how the Holy Spirit brings us to spiritual life from deadness. And that being born again is a work of the Spirit, and it's a necessary work um, for us to see the kingdom. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 14 says, The natural person uh, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So, regeneration. Um, this is a work of the Spirit. This bringing us to spiritual life, applying salvation to us. And we'll, we're actually going to have a whole lesson here in a few weeks on regeneration as we get into soteriology and things of that nature. But the Holy Spirit is doing that. And then third, the Holy Spirit continues the work after we believe the Gospel. Once converted... Um, once we've made, been made aware of our sin, once the Holy Spirit regenerates us, He doesn't leave us. He, he doesn't leave us that way. He, he stays with us and He works in us. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 13 and 14 says this, "...in Him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee..." of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. And so the Holy Spirit works in us to believe. He prepares our hearts to believe. 
And then, when He gives us the faith to believe, He keeps us. He, he works in us and keeps us and gives us assurance among other things. And we'll get into some of these other things. But let's go uh, to another table talk here. So, so all that was ways that we've considered the Spirit in our individual life. In what ways is the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the local church? So how are we dependent upon Him? So let's spend a few minutes and, and think about this question. Um, the life of the local church. Everybody sounds awfully quiet. <clears throat> in what ways is the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the local church? And so, I've got a few, and they're on the sheet here, but what do you guys think? And, and I'm thinking, can we think of anything like corporate, community, members, things like that? That's the kind of stuff we're targeting. What do you think? I got a thought. What do you think, Phil? You locked eyes. You can you can popcorn someone else. Good try. Terrible answer. No, it's good. That's good. That's uh, that's one of the ones on my list you mentioned. Well, here, let's consider a few, and then we'll get into some errors and uh, applications here. So first, first way is this. Unity in the church is from the Holy Spirit. Scripture teaches us that for unity to exist among God's people in any real sense, it's a power of the Spirit. I mean, just a quick verse, Ephesians 4, 3, 
And Paul writes that we are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And the divine name is there in the bond of peace. So the unity that exists in the local church, that is the Holy Spirit's work. And so we can, we can try really, really hard to muster that up. But we are dependent on the Holy Spirit of God to work that. To work that in us. So unity. Uh, second uh, general term here. New Testament tells us that the Holy Spirit supplies leaders in the church. So church leadership um, obviously is appointed uh, by church government and so on. But, but we recognize that it's the Holy Spirit who orchestrates that. It, it should be the Holy Spirit who calls and appoints leaders. Um, Acts 20, 28 says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which He obtained by His own blood. So that's a massive task. Uh, Paul describes here placed on leaders in the local church. And he says that it's the Holy Spirit who has done that. We can deduce there from the text. The third thing, I think I've got four, the power to engage unbelievers with the gospel is a work of the Holy Spirit. So having a community, having unity, work of the Holy Spirit. Having leaders for that community is a work of the Holy Spirit. And then that community going and taking the gospel to others is something empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that does that. In Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses, Jesus told the apostles, in, in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. All right? And so it's this missions, this engagement with unbelievers that is worked in us through the activity in the local church of the Holy Spirit. And fourth, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to each member of God's church. The Holy Spirit does this. In 1 Corinthians 12, now we mentioned this text earlier, but we'll go a little further to verse 7 says now there are a variety of gifts but the same spirit there are a variety of service but the same Lord and there are varieties of activities but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone to each look in verse 7 to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good so there is no Christian without a gift given them by the Holy Spirit for the advancement of Christ's kingdom. And I think sometimes we overlook this and we think, well, there's preachers and teachers and evangelists and singers and whatever, and I'm not any of them things, so I don't have a gift uh, to support the kingdom. And that's just absurd and unbiblical. Right? God has gifted us all uh, for specific purposes in, their, in our streams of influences and fields and where we are. Um, in a variety of ways. And the Holy Spirit does that to each one. Alright, this last uh, specific work uh, we'll look at is this one. And, and it's really similar to this last one, but it, we're really considering a, a bit of a different aspect here. But it is the Holy Spirit who indwells the people of God. Um, the Holy Spirit does this. And what's different from a regeneration and indwelling? Well, nothing. But they're, they're a little different way of understanding the purposes behind such. Um, obviously, we believe that God doesn't save us and leave us. He saves us and then calls us to a purpose. And, and that a purpose is accomplished through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Um, he indwells us and this is not a weird, charismatic thing, um, but this is 
a reality the Scripture teaches us for God's people is that they have the Holy Spirit living in them. We are filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. Now, another way we say that is that we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And that language, which we see in the New Testament, is a fulfillment of much older promises. Um, we'll look at two Old Testament texts first. Leviticus 26 um, God's Word says this, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. Again, in Exodus 29, we see this language uh, referring to God's relationship uh, with the people of Israel. It says, I will dwell among the people of Israel, and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord, their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. And so we, we understand this, and, and we consider the Old Testament text, and we see how God worked in among the people, and how He had this chosen nation, and how He dwelled among them in various ways and manifestations throughout the Old Testament. But that's not the end of it. right? And Paul, in 2 Corinthians 6, he says this, For we are the temple of the living God, as God said, I will make my dwelling among them, and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So Paul took these passages in the Old Testament, and he makes a direct application to new covenant life for Christians. Right? That the Holy Spirit dwells in us as much, if not more, than He did in in the visible manifestations we saw with the Old Testament Israelites. Um, and that might be hard for us to recognize. We, we think of the miraculous things that God did among them, but that was not as good as what we have with the Holy Spirit dwelling in us in this way in the New Covenant. So this is a fulfillment of God's promises. And then uh, this indwelling work of the Spirit, this goes to our sanctification. And so our being conformed into God's image, this is a work of the Spirit. The Spirit brings that about. In Romans 8, um, some parts from Romans 8, 3-5, through 5, "...by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk according to the Spirit." For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So even the moral requirements that God has for us, they're worked in us through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit working in us. And the Holy Spirit, you know, this indwelling work, I guess the point is, there is a continual work in every one of us for all of our life. We, the Holy Spirit is working in every single area of the Christian. In Galatians 5, 16, But I saw, uh, but I say, it's supposed to be say, just typing quickly. I saw. Um, he didn't say that. Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So it is obedience to God worked in us through the power of the Spirit that keeps us from engaging in our sinful desires of our sin nature. And 1 Peter 1, 2 describes sanctification, being of the Spirit. And so this work is attributed to the Holy Spirit. Further on, uh, 2 Corinthians three eighteen describes the believer as being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So our, our spiritual growth, our turning from wickedness to righteousness, all of these things. Every angle is a work of the Spirit. And all this is aided by the Spirit opening our eyes to see His work. Right? We, we cannot understand and interpret the Scriptures without the Holy Spirit. Um, even our prayer life, according to Romans 8, is helped and worked in us by the Holy Spirit. It's not, none of it's of us. I guess is the point. It's all glory and power and honor to the Spirit working in us. And then, even at the end of life, Romans eight eleven 
It says, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So from the beginning of creation, as we considered last week, the Spirit was working. And the Spirit is intimately active, beginning to end, every part of our life to bring us to the Father. It's all the Spirit. And He is probably the most neglected member of the Trinity, right? Yet He is so deeply involved in every part of our life, now beginning to end. And so hopefully rehearsing some of these things reminds us of that. And our desperate need for Him and the life-giving power He gives us. Um, so let's think about, um, as we wrap up here in the next minute or two, some major errors to avoid. And I've just got two listed, but when we think about the Holy Spirit, the works of the Spirit, let's hear from the crowd here. What are some errors that we might fall into uh, when it comes to how we understand the Holy Spirit? What do you guys think? Someone share a thought. Not listening. Not listening to what Spirit tells us. Sure. So, yeah, so we could, we could ignore it. The, the prompting, and Daryl kind of alluded to that earlier, you know, that that's definitely an error we can, we can do, right? That uh, we're, we're being led out of temptation or God's revealing us something from His Word and we can ignore it in obedience. Sure. What else? What, uh, what kinds of errors might we see in the world around? You know, think. We can, we see that, right? We see we see self-proclaimed prophets do those things today, right? And um, I just saw a, a, a fun social media page you guys should follow. It's called the Holy Note. Has anybody ever heard of the Holy Note? No. Okay. Just me. It's a new thing I follow. I'll show you later. It's really good. You'd love it. It's hilarious. No one's no one's laughing though. Um. Yeah. So. Here's the first one, and I think what we just shared is similar. The first one I mentioned, I will mention, is apathy toward the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. And that can, that can look like a lot of things. That can look in a practical way, uh, like we shared, um, ignoring the work of the Spirit um, actively in us. But I think also just neglecting this recognition of all that He does in our life um, because it's immeasurable. And, and I think that especially in Baptist circles like ours, uh, even more so maybe in Reformed, Reformedish circles, is, you know, hey, we, we so badly don't want to be like the charismatic cringe things we see. So we don't talk about the Spirit and we don't, think in those terms and we guard what we say because we don't want to be viewed as charismatic. And uh, that's no way to do theology. Right? We, we need to say what Scripture says. We need to believe what God's Word says. And so we, I think it's, it's very likely for us in, in our busyness to fail to grasp that from beginning to end the Holy Spirit has been everything. Now, in, in work, union with the Father, union with the Son, of course. But the Holy Spirit is deeply involved. Yeah.
Well, I mean, what, you know, what, one of the things I, I think about, and I think I wrote it, um, not we'll get to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, prayer is an ordinary means of grace, right? That God's called us to be doing, right? And like one of my favorite Charles Spurgeon quotes, and, and it may not even be him, but I, I always pretend it is and say it is because I, I thought I read that once and it's probably somebody else. But he said, um, many men of God uh, pray that God would give them the great work to do, missing the whole time that prayer is the great work. And, and that's what we're called to do. And we're, we're called to do that. And it's the Holy Spirit who aids our prayers. Right? E- even our, our praying, Romans 8 says, we, the Spirit groans the words we can't understand uh, to the Lord. And so, yeah, I mean, we, I don't think there's anything wrong with praying that God would send us more of the Holy Spirit. You know, as long as we're careful, we understand what we're not saying. But just because people might say that and it means something stupid doesn't mean that we can't say it. You know, we, we can't let error drive how we define things. And we do that a lot. And we do that a lot. Um, and one, one error that I'll mention just quickly. Excessive attention paid to the Holy Spirit leading to ignorance and imbalance. And we see this. Uh, we, we see this in the world. We don't have to go into a ton of details. Uh, and it might sound weird to say, you know, how could you give excessive attention to a member of the Godhead? Well, if you neglect the other two. <laughs> you know, if, if overemphasis to the neglect uh, and imbalance of how God has revealed Himself to us. Um, but we could, we could use a little more spirit thinking in our lives, right? We could. All right, close with this. Um, we're out of time. Uh, two quick applications. Uh, first, becoming conscious, conscious of the Holy Spirit and His ministries. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, we live out this doctrine when we're reminded of our need for the Spirit and, and how He's at work in our lives and how we need His help and how He helps us and how He enables us to do everything that we do and. As as Christ, as people become Christians, it's a work of the Spirit, right? As Christians mature, it's a work of the Spirit. As the church advances, it's a work of the Spirit. As the church is unified and growing in holiness, it's a work of the Spirit. And lastly, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, that sounds weird, Pentecostal. Well, Paul said it in Ephesians 5, 18, that we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So we can say it, and... And, and what does that mean? Well, kind of like Miko was saying earlier, that this is about a, a biblical posture of submitting to the Spirit's guidance. And what's that look like? Well, we pray, right? And, and, and we practice the means of grace, and we intake Scripture, and we pursue unity, and we, we join a church, and we serve, and we pray, and we sing, and we worship, and we recognize that all those things are done in and through us with the Spirit's help. And if he doesn't, they won't happen. And we trust that when we pray that God will work in us through the Spirit, we believe him. We, we believe that. We believe the promises that God has given us. All right. Well, we're out of time already. Uh, next week, considering the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, potential to get interesting when we think about that. Um, But thanks for your time tonight. Hope this has been uh, edifying to you and lots for us to consider. Um, I'll pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we we just want to praise you for how you revealed yourself to us in your word, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, three in one, working inseparably and every part uh, of your world, um, seen and unseen. And God, that you've promised that you've indwelled us with the Holy Spirit. And God, we're thankful uh, for His work in us, for His revealing your word to us, revealing our sin to us, um, giving us the energy and power to do what you've called us to do. And so God, we pray that you would awaken in our minds a recognition of the Spirit's work and that, God, you'd fill us with the Holy Spirit. 
that we can honor you um, in what we do and we can bring glory to your name uh, with the way that we live. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.